here in the audience, a QR code will appear on the screen for you to quickly respond. And if you have to leave before the program is over with, grab the QR code on your way out, drop in your comments. Now, just take a few moments. It won't hurt. And your comments really do help us. They help us to get feedback from you. What else, what did you like, not like? And we turn that into our sponsors to help them to appreciate how we spent their money. Now, before Leon begins, we'd like to share with you a short video clip about Lincoln Hospital, produced by Freetown Village for our Moments in the Indiana Black History series. You can see it again on the Freetown Village YouTube page, along with other videos researched by Eunice Trotter and produced by Freetown Village. At the conclusion of the video, you will hear Leon Bates. This is a little known Black history moment brought to you by Freetown Village. Discriminatory practices in healthcare led to the creation of Lincoln Hospital in Indianapolis. Blacks largely avoided treatment at public city hospital, which is now known as Eskenazi, because they feared inferior care by the white doctors. Although black doctors had received education equivalent to whites, black doctors were not allowed to practice there until 1942. Lincoln Hospital and Nursing School were founded in 1909 by a group of 10 local black doctors located in a two-story house at Senate Avenue and 11th Street. Lincoln had every necessity of a modern hospital. The doctors could provide more advanced care instead of being limited to only home or office visits. Its 12 rooms could accommodate 17 patients, regardless of their ability to pay. Unable to sustain a profit, Lincoln closed in 1915. For more information about Freetown Village, visit us at freetownvillage.org. Okay, sorry. Oh. That's the show on the road. Uh, I, when I get done, I hope you guys will be as interested and impressed as this gentleman we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about, as I was in learning about it. Um, I titled this Medical Apartheid because one of the books I used to research, that's the title of that book, and it will become obvious to you why I chose that title and why the author of that book chose that title. Did I aim this at you or at this day? I'm sharing this video. Make sure it's on. Ah, okay. Uh -oh. There you go. Okay. Let me put it here. Okay. Come on. This, I think, the first time I heard it, I was in junior high school, and it seems so, um, that's what I want to use, it's so relevant today. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And Truly We Are. It was written by George Santana in 1905. It comes out of his book, Reason. A few events that you probably want to try and remember through this presentation and later on is Dred Scott versus J.A. Sanford, 1857, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, Buck v. Bell, 1927. Buck v. Bell is the, the case where the United States Supreme Court decided that the state had the right to, against your will, sterilize you. Gary Buck in West Virginia, famous line from uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes in that case where he, they, the state wanted to sterilize her because they felt she had low morals and uh, she was a near idiot, I think they said. Oliver Wendell Holmes said three generations of idiots were enough. And the Supreme Court greenlighted her sterilization. That went on across the United States after that. Uh, the Hill-Burton Act, we'll talk about in a few minutes. The Hill-Burton Act basically is a federal government act that says if the federal government is supplying money to any state or county hospital, they have to treat everyone. This is one of the times the walls start to break down for 
racism in medical education in the medical system. Brown versus Board of Education, of course, most of us heard that. That actually undoes Plessy versus Ferguson. Simpton versus Cone, most people have not heard of that. That's another lawsuit where a hospital was segregating and discriminating against uh, patients, and it went to the Supreme Court. And uh, likewise, the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. You're getting federal money. You have to treat everyone the same way. The Indiana Anatomical Law was written in 1903. That was in response to grave robbing. Grave robbing was a real big problem across the United States, and it became one here in Indiana. And there was a huge case in 1902, and after it was over with, the state of Indiana wrote a law about grave robbing, but it also sets up the anatomical board where that becomes problematic later. Long story short, what that means is if, the, the number one, the medical schools can no longer source their own cadavers for research. They get them from the state, from the state anatomical board. That stopped the buying process. The state set up a system, but the state system also said, if you die in the custody of a state or county official, county jail, county poor home, state prison, mental hospital, you name it, and your family did not claim your remains within a certain number of days, then you could be turned over to the anatomical board and then go into medical science. They used that against African-Americans with a vengeance. Um, the Indiana eugenics law, that goes back to Buck v. Bell. Indiana started its eugenics process 20 years before the federal court got into it. And Henry Hellcat Thomas, most of you have never heard of him. Henry Hellcat Thomas gets into a gunfight with the police. He's killed in the process and his wife is arrested for his crimes, put in the Marion County Jail, they consigned his body to medical research. The Marion County coroner signed his body over. I got a copy of his death certificate. When I first saw it, it where it says cemetery on the death certificate, his said anatomical board. And I said, I never heard of that cemetery. I wonder where that is. And it took a few minutes for the light to come. I'm like, wait a minute, that's not a cemetery. So then I learned the whole story about that. A uh, few names to know, Samuel Cartwright, J. Marion Sims, Thomas Perrin, Eugene Dibble, they are all outside of Indiana. Samuel Elbert, Joseph Alexander, Paul Robinson, and Joseph Ward are all inside Indiana. Cartwright, Sims, Perrin, and Dibble participated in some of the most gruesome, ghoulish medical experiments in the United States you can think of. Um, Samuel Cartwright, and I'm gonna, I'll get to them in a minute, Elbert was the first African-American doctor in Indianapolis. Joseph Alexander was a white doctor at one of the local medical schools who was actually procuring the remains. While other people went to trial, other African-Americans went to trial and went to prison for what they did, Alexander stood trial, found not guilty, and went on about his business. Paul F. Robinson was a member of it. He was a Marion County coroner, and he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. He's the one who sends uh, Henry Hellcat Thomas's body into the medical system. Joseph Ward, who we're gonna talk about a lot this evening, was an African-American doctor here in Indianapolis. He's a first generation freedman. He made several significant, um, I don't wanna say advances, but he, he, he made several, um, I can't think of the term I wanna use. The man just did a lot. If I did half of what, if I do half of what he did, I will have accomplished something myself. What uh, Eskenazi Hospital, someone brought that up here just a minute ago. Eskenazi Hospital has a long history in this city. Most people don't realize that. It dates back to 1859 when the state of Indiana rewrote the laws that allowed cities to incorporate. They give Indianapolis the right to create a medical, uh, not a medical, but a health department which also gives them the right to tax and create the first hospital in the state of Indiana. That's how far back Eskenazi's lineage goes. Other hospitals associated with it, Indianapolis Flower Mission, Robert Long Hospital, Sunnyside Hospital, James Wilkin Riley Hospital for Children, Coleman Hospital, and University Hospital, all in some way are affiliated with this same process. Um, I just put these other things up there just as a thing to know. Eskenazi has the only burn center in Indianapolis. 
maybe the only one in Indiana, but I know it's the one in Indianapolis. You have uh, four level one trauma, trauma centers in the city, four transplant centers, and four mental hospitals. All of them come up after Eskenazi. I learned about Dr. Ward when I was researching this man, William Whitfield. He's the first African-American police officer killed in line of duty in Indianapolis, and I believe the first one in the state of Indiana. He was shot in June of 1922, and he didn't die until November. He lingered in the hospital for several months and died of complications from his, his wounds. His death certificate said he died at Ward Sanitarium. Never heard of it. No one I kept asking had ever heard of it. And we'll get into why that is. But I started out with this guy here. Dr. Joseph Ward, he's buried at Crown Hill Cemetery. And up until a few years ago, this was the only only mark, any marker that he had ever been in Indianapolis, he ever accomplished anything. That is his government issued grave marker at Crown Hill Cemetery. And if you learn the military's lingo and jargon, that LT, LT COL is Lieutenant Colonel, MC Medical Corps, RES Reserves, World War I. When I saw that for the first time, I'm like, who the hell was this guy? I knew African-Americans fought in the First World War. I did not know there were African-American doctors in the First World War. Then he's a lieutenant colonel. That's pretty high ranking. Who the hell was he? That's Dr. Joseph Ward, uh, not long, or around the time that he got his medical license. Um, we think that, well, in fact, this one, I know where it came from, Washington, D.C. Um, I've got others, I'm not sure where they came from, but that's him, right? He got his medical license here in Indianapolis in 1897. He was born in 1872 in Wilson, North Carolina. He comes to Indianapolis as a teenager and he lives with another white doctor named George Hasty. Hasty ran the phys Physio Medical College here in Indianapolis. And when he comes here, he's a teenager. He goes to Short Ridge High School, finishes Short Ridge, and then goes straight into the uh, Physio Medical College. At the time, you didn't have to have a college degree to go to medical school. You could go straight out of high school and get in, and that's what he did. The man wanted to be a medical doctor. He was born in the same slave cabin that his mother was born in, on the same plantation. In 1872, still living there, his grandfather was his mother and grandmother's owner. There we go. Here's a copy of his medical license. I found this at the State Archives by accident one day. I was looking for something else and came across these ledgers and started flipping through them. And when I, when I realized what I had, I started looking for it and I found this. That's a copy of his medical license that's in the ledger book at the State Archives from 1897 when he became a licensed physician in Indiana. He was not the first, but he was early on. That's an image of um, Charles Emerson Hall over at IU, or IUPUI on the city's west side. I picked that because that's the building that they put the IU School of Medicine in in 1908. Below that, it talks about the Flexner Report. I won't get into that other than to say that the Flexner Report was a document uh, paid for by the Carnegie Foundation that looked at medical care across the United States and Canada. When that document came out, before this document came out, you had subscription medical schools. If you could pay the fees, you could get in. They were not organized. They were not run by any kind of legislation or any act or anything else. They were just out there. And one of the things that he pointed out was how poorly they, how poorly run they were and these rules, and Canada was the same way. After his report comes out in 1910, medical schools radically, drastically change. And Indiana creates, because they know it's coming, they've already seen their part in it. They create the IU School of Medicine in 1908, and all the subscription medical schools go out of business. Medical apartheid, Harriet Washington. Um, she goes into all of the gruesome details about what's wrong with medicine. And a lot of times people don't understand or wonder why, especially African-Americans don't necessarily trust medical doctors. She goes into that, race and pain. I saw a nursing book just a couple of years ago, a nursing textbook, brand new one, 
And it said that African-Americans did not feel pain the same as whites. In this book being produced today, um, quick story about that. When I was a kid, a kid that lived across the street from us had these funny little scars all over his face. And one day my mom asked his mother how he got those scars. My mom went to nursing school and she told her he was riding in the front seat of the car with his dad going to church and some drunk ran a stop sign. His dad hit him. He was thrown into the windshield in Marion, Indiana. When she got to the hospital, she said she could hear him coming through the door. They had him in the ER, holding him down to the table, suturing his face with cat gut. Cat gut, for those that don't know, is a very heavy string. It's almost thread. It's almost like a string. They were suturing his face without anesthetic. So there's a long history behind that. Driftomania. We'll talk about that here in a minute for those that never heard of it. Driftomania is a condition African Americans suffered because they kept running away from enslavement. There had to be something wrong with you. You ran away. It was, this whole idea was formed by Dr. Sam McCartwright, a medical doctor, and he wrote a paper about it. And I'm going to mess this up. I apologize. Visio vaginal fessula. It's a long word for an opening that's not supposed to be there between the vagina and the, uh, the bladder, which causes incontinence. It is a pro it has been a problem in the world for centuries until J. Marion Sims came up with a solution for it. In order to get that solution, he practiced on enslaved women. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment. That went on for 40 years from 1932 to 1972 before it was stopped, even though a cure in the disguise of penicillin was discovered and widely distributed in, by 1942. For 30 years after penicillin was put on the market, the U.S. government continued this experiment. Most of you have probably heard of Henrietta Lacks. There's a movie about that and a book about her story and how Johns Hopkins University used her, harvested her cells, and are still using her cells today. When you hear HeLa cells, that's a combination of the first two letters from her first and last name. They still use those in research today. They got those cells from Henrietta Lacks. The cells will reproduce in a Petri dish. And then Delicia and Catricia Africa, two girls who were killed in the 1990s in the Philadelphia police bombed the move headquarters and burned down a city block. Some of their remains were found in the house and were taken to uh, um, University of Pennsylvania in their anthropology lab. And until about two, three years ago, they were still there. And then finally the school had to shame, shamefully admit, yes, we had them, we always knew who they were and gave them back to the family. There's a long history of medical science and its problems. Uh, when the, the Flexner report came out and started making changes to the medical system, there were over 120, I think 120, yeah, 120 black, black medical schools in the United States. When that thing was published, we were down to two. Howard and Meharry are the only two African-American medical schools in the United States. All the others are gone. Here's Dr. Sam McCartwright. That article was published in DuBose um, periodical in 1851. If you ran away from enslavement, there was something wrong with you. And the solution for it, according to Dr. Sam McCartwright, was to whip the hell out of them. That's what that looks like. Um, that man's name was Gordon. He ran away. He was found in Mississippi, signed up to the U.S. Army to fight in the Civil War. And one of the things they did when he signed up is that someone saw his back and had him pose so they could photograph those scars. This is what slavery had done to people in the United States. This is Samuel Cartwright's handiwork. J. Marion Sims, I talked about him a minute ago. Sims um, 
creates the cure for the visio vaginal fistula by taking enslaved women who had this problem and then having other enslaved women hold the woman down while he cut and suture on her most sensitive body parts without anesthetic. Once he perfected the methodology, he shuts down his Alabama clinic, sells off the women, goes to New York, and starts to sell this procedure in New York City to white women that he gave plenty of anesthetic to. They were put to sleep. They were given morphine afterwards. But he perfected it in African-American women. So there's a reason why the people African-Americans don't trust the medical system. Dr. Thomas Perrin, he's the one who, the white doctor who oversaw the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. It got so good to him, he went to Guatemala and did it again. Those are the last known uh, survivors of that experiment in that photograph right there. And there's just some of the details about what went on. Keep in mind that this went on in 1972, but the cure had been known since 1942. I talked about medical experimentation here in Indiana. This is referring back to that. King of the ghouls, an African-American named Rufus Cantrell was the leader of a group of body snatchers. They would go out to the cemeteries and they would go to the freshly buried people and unearth them and take them to the medical school and sell them. They went all over Marion County and surrounding counties doing this. And they did it for a number of years before they were finally caught in 1902. Cantrell went to the prison at Michigan City. And I think he was there for like seven years and he left and went to Michigan and lived in Detroit and he's buried in Detroit. At least we hope he's been in Detroit. Ah, the pickling vat. This was a euphemism that, oh, my knee is killing me. This is a euphemism that we came up with in this country. We always had to have a way to describe something. People who were going to be sent to medical education were put in vats of formaldehyde, and they were allowed to stay there until they were needed by the medical students. But in the newspaper, they called them pickling vats. This particular gentleman got into a gunfight in Indianapolis with the police. He killed a police officer. He's convicted of killing a police officer. He sent to Michigan City. His family is poor. They don't really know what to do, how this is going to end. But they're hearing what's being written in the newspaper. And they go to CMC Willis, a Willis funeral home. Talk to old Mr. Willis and what can we do? And Willis thinks about it for a day or so, comes up with a plan. Willis contacts the state, and when the man is hanged at Michigan City, his body is transferred to a local mortician in Michigan City. He's embalmed, put in a wooden crate, sent to Indianapolis, care of CMC Willis Funeral Home. He's picked up down at the train station, brought over to Willis's facility. Willis dresses him, puts him in a inexpensive coffin, and then puts a tin can on his chest with a little card that says, please give what you can. In the black community, throughout the day and the, the next day when they had the funeral, kept coming in to see the body and dropping nickels and dimes and quarters into this can. By the time that two days was up, he had more than enough to pay for the, uh, the grave, the funeral services, and even the shipping from Michigan City back to Indianapolis. Had he not done that, he would have ended up going into medical experimentation. Let's jump now to, that's, what City Hospital looked like in probably 1863-64, the thing to really know is that this brick section right here was built in 1859 by Marion County. When the Civil War starts, the U.S. Army is not prepared and they don't have a facility. The U.S. Army requisitions this hospital from the city of Indianapolis and it becomes an Army hospital. That white addition you see there, that's a wooden addition and it's T-shaped and it's huge. That was put on the back of the hospital by the U.S. Army. And once the U.S. Army left, they left the building and the city got to inherit it without having to pay for it. But that city hospital at the top right there, you see there's someone, possibly a soldier, raising the flag above the hospital. That's the same building. Now they have put permanent brick additions on the building. 
on either side right there. Now, keep in mind, as that other video was playing, they said African-Americans could not train here. They, but most times, many times, could not be patients. They did have African-American patients. I'll show you some of that in a minute. But for the most part, this was white only. White doctors were not allowed to practice there. Very, very few were trained there until the 1940s. Um, it just did not happen. And it was not because the Indiana law said it couldn't happen. It was the policy of the hospital, the people who ran the hospital. Uh, this is inside the hospital. And I think the gentleman standing right here is William Niles Wishard, who they named Wishard. Uh, General Hospital becomes Wishard in the 1970s. That's who they named it after. Um, I find it interesting. If you look at that picture real carefully, I think that's an African-American doctor sitting right there. But this is from 1887. At least that's what it says in the records where I found it. But there's an African-American doctor in that group. If you go over to the medical museum at uh, Indiana, where Indiana uh, Central State Hospital used to be, now it's something else, that they have a room that looks just like this. I got heavy handed on the controls. My apologies. They have a room that looks just like this over there with the walls and the steep stairs and all that. And when I first saw this, that's what I thought it was, but they said, no, it's actually over there at Old City Hospital. Here's one of the operating rooms. And this reminds me of going into an auto mechanic shop. Tools hanging up on the wall and everything. It's like, oh, it just, you know, it just does not impress me as being a surgery area. And then here's the oil change pan right here. Okay. That's actually not the oil, but what can I tell you? This is what the hospital looked like inside. This is the interior. Notice those shiny wooden floors, uh, the clean conditions, and you have more than enough nurses to deal with the patients. Like I said, they did take African-American patients. I'm not sure what was going on in this photograph. The lady on the left in that black is probably some type of an administrator. I'm not sure what she does. The other two women are nurses. And then here's a doctor posing for this photograph in one of the treatment areas. So African-Americans could go there and get treatment. That did happen. Now, notice this area. See that big window right there? Big window right there. This is a window well. These are window wells. There's the floor joist above. It looks like they may have a solid floor here, but I'm not sure. You see how close these people are together? Most of these are African-American men. Um, this girl could be what they would have termed called mulatto or mixed race. Same with this child here. But you have children and adults in the same area. And on the back of this photograph, it's called the Incurables Ward of the Pest House. And I think that building was where the back of Eskenazi Hospital is today, is where that was located, I believe. I'm not sure yet. I'm still working on that. But it was a separate area, but you can see that it's segregated, and you see what kind of conditions they're keeping them in. Um, the flip side of that, I don't have a photograph of it, but... Um, I mentioned Sunnyside Hospital. If this is a TB ward, Sunnyside was much, much better than this. It was more like what you saw in that other photograph. It did not look like this, but Sunnyside, again, was all white. This is what we faced as medical care in Indianapolis. Robert Long Hospital, built in 1914. That building is still there. It's not no longer used as a hospital, but it's part of the IU Medical School. Um, refused to take African-Americans. And that went on up until the 1940s when finally the laws were changed. Bear in mind here in Indiana, it was not law, but it was practice and accepted practice. This thing do go to sleep. I thought I was. Oh, there it goes. Okay, um, this is just an example of a woman that I found in 1914 who was turned away, and I believe she went to the city hospital and got the treatment that she needed. 
someone did some paperwork and got her in there. She was from Southern Indiana, came with a condition needing surgery, long refused, and then she went down the street to City Hospital where the county paid for it, and she got the surgery she needed, and she survived and went home. But this is, again, what was going on here in Indianapolis. Even though she went to City Hospital and they took her, she could not have an African-American doctor if she wanted. She had to have whatever white doctor they gave her. This is what... Uh, yeah, please. Okay. Um, Flanner House. Most of us have heard of Flanner House here in Indianapolis. This is how Flanner House starts, is why they call it a house. It starts in a house. And it's mainly supplied, uh, not supplied, but it is uh, funded by Frank Flanner, who was the owner of Flanner Funeral Home that later becomes Flanner and Buchanan. He provided much of the funding, and this is what was served as preventative medicine for African Americans in Indianapolis for decades. And this photograph was probably taken around 1900. That building, that house is no longer there. It stood where, between where the IU hospital is and the IU medical center, um, medical school. In between those two buildings is where this house stood on Colton Street. Move it again, please. Now, if you needed hospitalization, you in mass sickness hit Indianapolis, and it did many times, and you're African American, you ended up in the basement of Bethel AME Church or Second Baptist, which is about a block down the street from this building. The black doctors in Indianapolis, and there was probably a dozen or so, worked and took shifts coming back and forth to Second Baptist and to um and a, uh, Bethel AME to provide the medical care these people needed. The women of the church provided the nursing care and the, the meals. And this went on for sometimes weeks or months. And I had never heard of this. And I was lucky enough to meet a lady named Frances Stout many years ago. And she explained to me how this worked. And when I went into the basement of this building, look, I could see how they, the building was built up so that they had large windows that could open in the summertime for ventilation but there was enough room to put probably 40 beds in that basement, if not more, if they crammed them in there. And Second Baptist Church, which is now a private residence, underneath their choir stand is a large open area. You could do the same thing underneath there. And that's what they were planning for was when mass sickness like flu and, and, and other things went through the city, you could be turned away if you're African-American from city hospital. So where would you go if you're too sick to take care of yourself these two churches stepped into the breach, and this went on for decades in Indianapolis. Frances Stout told me she remembered as a kid and a young woman actually helping her grandparents when this happened. Okay. That's an image of Second Baptist Church on Michigan Street. It's been very differently changed, but the, that building is still there. And there again, you can see the work these large windows right here the church main sanctuary is up here all of this down here is basement space where they could set up a ad hoc hospital okay um this is lincoln hospital they were talking about a minute ago this is one of the images i found in the recorder newspaper um lincoln there were three let me back up there were four known black hospitals in indianapolis Provident Hospital, which was the first and didn't last very long. Uh, we can't find any records on it. Then Lincoln Hospital, the Sisters of Charity, and Ward Sanitarium. This one is Lincoln, and it was in a big house at, at 11th and Senate. There is a historical marker there now for this particular hospital. The building's long gone. The interstate took it out. Okay. This is a uh, Sisters of Charity Hospital. It was at 15th and Missouri basically south of 16th Street where Methodist Hospital sits. That's where this one was. Um, and it had several homes. This was uh, in 1911. By the 1930s, they had moved over on Blackford Street near IUPUI. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Ward Sanitarium, Joseph Ward. Ward Sanitarium, this house was across the street from where... Um, where um, Walk, the Walker Theater sits. It was one block down and across the street. 
Dr. Ward started his sanitarium over here and there were newspaper articles about it in the Star, the Recorder, the News. Even some white doctors in town talked about how nice and efficient it was. One of the things it had over the others is that it offered a modern surgery facility. Dr. Joseph Ward was a surgeon. And one of the reasons that he did this was he wanted to practice surgery, but he couldn't go to any of the hospitals and do it. So he had to create his own space. And he did that all his life, create a space where he could be a surgeon. He was the doctor to Madam Walker, many other prominent people here in town. I found an article where he actually did eye surgery on someone. Uh, the man was ahead of his time. And he set this big house up and his wife and kids lived, I think on the first floor and the patients were on the second floor, if I remember correctly, but that's how he gets started doing this. Okay. Um, Dr. Sumner Furness was, came, he comes along after Dr. Ward, he's here in town. And you can see this is in his office and some of the uh, instruments, the tools of the trade and the medical glass cases there. Um, I just found this, again, this, this image fascinating. He has the old candlestick telephone there on his desk in front of him. And that little bitty typewriter there in front of that lady, <laughs> That's a manual typewriter. You had to actually punch those keys. But, okay, go ahead. Um, we're back over here inside of the Flanner House again. That's Dr. Henry Hummins. He was a medical doctor here for years. He went to the IU School of Medicine, and then he actually interned in Shelbyville. And once his internship was over, he comes back to Indianapolis. Um, the other person you see there is either a mother or an older sister, and the nurse is taking information from them. He's listening to the kids, uh, probably his lungs. Okay. Uh, this one got out of place, but that's okay. The African-American population in the city was growing. And one of the things that was becoming apparent was that there was not enough hospital space. And this one is from 1928. The City of Indianapolis, through a couple of uh, private foundations, got the money together and paid a doctor, a specialist to come from Chicago named, uh, named Walsh, if I remember correctly, William Walsh. No, Marsh. Marsh comes to Indianapolis and does a survey of all of the hospital beds in Indianapolis and finds out how many beds there are and how many are for African Americans, and there's almost zero. And he tells them that they actually need to build a black hospital in 1928. And the city of Indianapolis considered doing it. 1929, the stock market crash, everything goes to hell. And this, you can still find this, this uh, report that he wrote at the Indianapolis Library and at the IUPUI Library. You can actually read the document. It's only about 100 pages. It's not very long. But he said that they did need beds. That was the gist of it. Go ahead. I just named off those hospitals a minute ago um, and some of the other people that were important and involved in that. Melinda Thomas ran the Sisters of Charity Hospital for a number of years, and the Sisters of Charity is, still exists today. I'm not sure exactly what all they do, but they're a charity group. We talked about uh, Sumner Furness, he was a doctor. Uh, Lawrence Lewis was a doctor and surgeon. Henry Hummins was a doctor here in town. Uh, all of them active in trying to bring medical care to African Americans. Go ahead. Here again, they're talking about 300 beds for the hospital. Um, one of the things they pointed out is it would give the black doctors and nurses a place to actually train. Um, they wouldn't take black nurses over at uh, the mission, uh, um, the Bellflower Mission Hospital. They wouldn't take him at City Hospital. They wouldn't take him at Long Hospital. So where's an African-American woman to get trained if they won't take her? Um, Dr. Ward, surprisingly enough, when he comes along and gets his hospital up and going, he actually goes to City Hospital, convinces them to allow his student nurses to sit through lectures and then come back to his facility and then do their clinical training with him. So that was one of the trade-offs. It's one of the ways that some of the local Black nurses got their early training. Okay, go ahead. Dr. Ward's an interesting guy. When World War I breaks out in April of 1917, Joseph Ward was 45 years old. He closes his medical practice, joins the U.S. Army, 
to be a surgeon during the First World War at 45. He could have easily sat out, but he did not. He was the oldest of the 104 African-American doctors who served during the First World War. Uh, his rank here is shown as being a captain. That's kind of a fluke when I found out all these African-American doctors who joined the Army and went through a special school, the uh, U.S. Army Medical Training School colored. That it was the first and only time the U.S. Army did this. They took all of these civilian African American doctors, put them in this colored training school, and taught them how to be officers. When typically, when a doctor goes into the army, he's made a captain. These guys were made first lieutenants, one step down. But they still noticed Ward's just his abilities and how he could organize and keep things going. And some of the white officers write in his file that at the first opportunity, he should be promoted. He gets to Camp Perry, Ohio for some further training and then on to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey before they head overseas. And somewhere along there, they promote him actually to captain. So he's one of the first African-American captains as a medical officer. Go ahead. That's the ship he went over on, the USS Orizaba. Uh, my daughter actually found this photograph. She actually found the other document too. Uh, I give her credit, I did not do that. I didn't know they even existed. But this is a ship that he wanted over on going to France. Go ahead. This is what an artist came up with a rendering of what it was like for the 92nd and 93rd divisions. There were two African American divisions in World War I, the 92nd and 93rd. And we're not sure which one this is actually supposed to be in either one of them. If you notice, um, and it's not really clear, but this man here is an officer. And you can't tell for sure if he's black or if he's white. His head is turned, you just can't tell it. But all the other men you see here are African Americans. They are the foot soldiers, but that man's an officer. We don't know if he is black or white. That's probably intentional. Go ahead. Here again, the 92nd, 93rd Division. What's important here is the number of wounded and killed, especially the 93rd Division. They had 467 killed or died of disease and 3,000 wounded during the war. And they were only there a little over a year. Um, 92nd was not quite as bad. Go ahead. If you thought being a doctor was going to save you from harm, this is Dr. Urban Bass. Bass was at a battalion aid station behind the line treating wounded soldiers when a shell went off and almost severed both his legs. He bled to death. He's the only one of the doc African-American doctors to be killed during the war, and he was killed by a shell explosion. He was buried in France. His wife took it extremely hard. I don't think she ever really recovered, but she convinced the U.S. government to bring his remains home, and he's buried in Richmond, Virginia, in a military cemetery, and she's buried close to him. Um, she died many years later, but she never remarried, and she never got over the fact that he didn't come back. So let no one think that being a doctor in the Army, especially in that time, was going to protect you from, from the danger. It did not. Go ahead. Here's Dr. Ward again. Now he's on board ship and he's returning home. You notice those of you that have been in the military, he's now a major, which was a major fluke. Um, that's the passenger list of the people coming back and he's been penciling at the bottom. And I'm not sure why that happened. What's interesting about that photograph, you look at it very carefully, you see his uniform looks well-worn, um, but also the hat. I can't tell if that's his hair needs a haircut or if the hat is just needs replacing. Dr. Ward, while he was there in France, I think it was in uh, September of, or October, his son died in the flu pandemic here in the United States. And he was notified and he basically collapsed. One, he was probably exhausted, and two, the news of it. His son was nine years old, um, took the wind out of him. They took him to a hospital at Toul, France, and he was there for several days recovering before he came back to duty again. While he was there, after a day or so, he kind of got back on his feet. He couldn't help himself. One, they didn't realize he was African-American when they put him in there. Two, he gets up at night and he's going from bed to bed in his robe and pajamas and he's checking on the other wounded soldiers. He's adjusting bandages and he's checking on their condition, handing out water if they're awake or whatever. 
And the next morning, they noticed bandages had been changed or had been adjusted. Who's doing this? And then one night, they caught him in the act. He's up out of his bed, and he's roaming. And the Army, especially at this time, when they had people in a, a hospital, it was a war. You had beds lined up on both sides, and there's no privacy. And he's just going from bed to bed, checking on everybody. He'd go back and get in his own bed. He couldn't help himself. He was a medical doctor. They caught him in the act, started talking to him, found out where he had come from, you know, his training, his background, and were fascinated that he was an African-American and was that skilled of a surgeon. As he is headed back or getting prepared to head back, word comes that they need a new commander for a field hospital with the 92nd Division where he came from. That white doctor had been promoted and sent someplace else. So this group of doctors at this general hospital write on his paperwork that he would be perfect for the job. The Army signs off on it. He's sent back, and then someone realizes, wait a minute, we just promoted a black man to run a U.S. Army field hospital. By the time they realize it, it's too late. He's already got the oak leaf cluster on his shoulder. He's got the papers in his hand, and he's back handing the papers over. And the division says, okay, fine. You are a new field hospital director. Divisions at the time in World War I had four field hospitals. They had one for um, gas injuries. They had one for disease. They had one for tra trauma. And they had one for shell shock or PTSD. He goes to the one for trauma surgery. That's where he goes. And he runs that one for the rest of the war. And then he comes back to the United States. But he's already been a surgeon for almost 20 years before he gets there. He is very skilled at what he's doing. He's very organized to be able to keep the people moving and keep things going the way they should. He is the perfect guy for the job. When the war ends, they don't come back and wonder he's like, kept that document. You notice the date on there is February 2nd. That's when they finally come home. The war ends in November, and many of the soldiers are already sent home, but he and the other medical staff are held over because they're people who are too sick or too injured to go home, so they don't get on ships until February to come home. And he, when he gets back to the United States, he doesn't go home. He goes to Camp Upton, New York, where there he's still treating injured and wounded soldiers, and while he's there in May of 1919, um, Madam C.J. Walker falls ill, in St. Louis, and is taken back to her home in New York, in uh, Irvington, New York, which is north of the city. And Camp Upton, I think, was on Long Island. Somehow they get word to him, and because that was one of his patients, and Walker had been raising money for the war effort, things like that, some strings were pulled, and he was allowed to meet the train in New York City and then follow it up to Irvington, and then he was at her bedside when she died. That's the whole point. Um... That's in May. He does not get back home to Indianapolis until June of 1918. Um, most of the soldiers have been home for months before that happens. Go ahead. Oh, that's the ship he comes back on. That's the SS La France. Uh, it, you notice how it doesn't look quite as beat up and, 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 and battle-worn as this one does. Or this one doesn't look as battle-worn as the other one. It's basically a hospital ship. Um, they Now we're bringing soldiers back in a different condition. Go ahead. This is one of the African-American soldiers who came back was not so lucky. He's lost his right leg. He more likely, especially if he's in the 92nd Division, was treated by Dr. Ward and, and or some of his colleagues. If he's with the 93rd, he's treated by the African-American doctors over there. Um, there were quite a few African-Americans, whites, others that came home like this. And he has not been fitted yet for his prosthetic leg. Okay, go ahead. This is Dr. Joseph Ward in 1924, I think it is. In 1923, he is hired by the Veterans Administration, or it was the Veterans Bureau at the time, to run Tuskegee VA Hospital Number 91 at Tuskegee, Alabama. The U.S. Army had 360,000 African American veterans of the First World War, and many of them needed treatment. And most of, if not all, the VA hospitals would turn the African-American veterans away at the door, would not let them in. So the U.S. government solution was to build a hospital for black veterans. They built it at Tuskegee, Alabama. They at first were going to have a white doctor in charge and a white staff. The NAACP, the Urban League, several women's groups got up in arms, and there was 
a severe uproar in the American Medical Association, which would not accept African-American doctors, tried to say that there was not an African-American doctor who was capable of running the hospital. <laughs> there was a general named uh, Frank Hines who was over logistics that somehow came across Dr. Ward when they're moving those soldiers back home. And Hines becomes aware of Ward's skills and his abilities. So once they start to seriously consider a black doctor in uh, people like Du Bois said, there's many of them and Du Bois supplied a list and so did several others. Hines says, he knows Dr. Ward. He's good. He is a veteran. He served in the First World War. He ticks all the boxes. And Hines convinces um, uh, Warren, Warren, President Warren. Um, I'm drawing a blank. Warren. Thank you. Warren Harding. Warren G. Harding. Thank you. He convinces Harding, who Harding, if I remember correctly, had a Ku Klux Klan ceremony in the White House. He convinces Harding to hire Dr. Ward and put him in charge. Every, at the time, I don't think it's still done today, but at the time, every doctor who was a medical officer in charge of a VA hospital was given the equivalent rank of a colonel in the U.S. Army, except Dr. Ward. He was made a lieutenant colonel. He takes it. He goes to Tuskegee, and for 12 years, he runs that hospital at, at Tuskegee. Go ahead. I think I got a, there's an image of what it looked like uh, years ago. Most of it is still there. That is the Tuskegee VA Hospital. It is sitting between Tuskegee University and the Tuskegee Army Airfield. Um, if you were African American in the United States in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, up to the 50s, and you needed medical care, you're an African American veteran, you had to go to Tuskegee, Alabama. This was Veterans Hospital number 91 when it was constructed. That means there were 90 other veterans hospitals that African Americans were barred from, including the one here in Indianapolis. Dr. Ward could not go into the VA hospital here as neither a patient nor a doctor. This is the only one they could go to, Tuskegee VA Hospital. Okay, go ahead. This is a picture of the executive staff. If you notice, every one of these folks up here is African American, and Dr. Ward had a hand in hiring all of them. Um, they had all the different medical services they needed. It was totally self-sufficient. Um, the state of Alabama was very upset with the U.S. government because the U.S. government let Dr. Ward say that he would hire black nurses. The state was going to have white nurses. And they fought back and forth. And then Dr. Ward and some others pointed out, Alabama state law said it was illegal for white nurses to tend to African-American men. So Alabama's solution was we'll get uh, black nurses' aides to do what the nurses told us to tell them to do. And he said that was not necessary. There were African-American nurses who could do it. He knew of African-American nurses. He was not going to stand for it. He put up a fight. He won. He got African-American nurses. Um, they were some of the best paid nurses and doctors in the country. He had a budget of over $1 million a year in 1924. And he hit every inspection target he needed to, he was supposed to. Uh, never had any kind of a blemish on this record at that hospital. The patients were well cared for, were happy. One of the things that got him into trouble, but at the same time, to show you how they felt about it, was that I think the lady, the nurse here on the right, I think that's Geneva Patterson. She also becomes his dietitian. Geneva Patterson, with his approval, partially maybe with his instruction, goes to the black farmers around Tuskegee and buys their crop. And the locals wanted them to go through the co-op and buy from the co-op, which was white owned and operated. And the blacks could sell to it, but they had to sell it at a discounted rate. Dr. Ward said, no, we'll buy it right from the, the farmer. And Geneva Patterson had a checkbook and she wrote a check right out to the farmer, not to the co-op or anybody else. She wrote the check right straight to him and paid market rate. Whatever the going rate was, that's what she was paying. 
the African American farmers for a number of years did fairly well supplying the Tuskegee VA hospital. They bought most, in fact, they bought all of their fresh fruits and vegetables right there on site. The canned ones they got in. Uh, they also ran a butcher shop, a bakery where they baked all their bread, pies, cakes, all those kind of things. So there was a number of bakers there at this place. The veterans at Tuskegee were very well fed. Go ahead. Um, Dr. Ward, like I said, went there in 1924. He stays in 1936. He comes back to Indianapolis and goes back to his sanitarium that his brother-in-law, Dr. Uh, Batiste, Dr. Paul Batiste had been running in his absence. He picks back up and he goes back to being a doctor here in Indianapolis for a number of years until he finally closes the sanitarium about 1943, 1944. After City Hospital, now, I may have general by then, decides it's going to have African-American doctors or African-American interns. They start out with interns and then let them work up the resident and eventually doctor. Same with nurses and patients. His wife becomes a patient there like in 1944, 45, and he closes his sanitarium he said, because there's no need for it now. The hospital will actually accept these people. But from... 1907 until 19, probably 43, 44, it's one of the few places that African-Americans could go, have an African-American doctor be treated um, humanely, decently, um, like you were a human being and not have to worry if you were going to be mistreated or not giving pain medication or whatever. And that's what he did his, his entire medical career. This is at 21st and Boulevard place, right at the bottom of the northbound ramp on the I-65. That's where that marker stands. We got that put up a couple of years ago. Um, I did the research and got the marker stuck. I just could not believe that we do not know who this man was and what he did. So... I had to learn how you do the process. I got the application filled out. Well, here we are. Uh, go ahead. Lincoln Hospital. There's now a marker for Lincoln Hospital. That's over at 11th and Senate, not too far away from 21st Street. Um, I went to grad school with the lady who got this done and got the marker put up. Um, she was just a year or two ahead of me in school. That marks the second one. Uh, go ahead. Sister Charity has now been approved. I know the lady who got that one approved. Uh, I'm not sure where the marker's going to go, but it's going to go on the IUPUI campus somewhere, I'm told. Um, so now we will have all three of the Black hospitals in this city marked. One of the things about Joseph Ward is that not only did he treat people in Indianapolis, I saw accounts where he actually was treating people who were coming from as far away as Richmond to the east, Terre Haute to the west, uh, Muncie and Kokomo to the north and south of Bedford. People coming to him to have their surgery. Also, when they came there, if their own doctor wanted to come with them, they could and he could assist Dr. Ward. He was that open with. There were people who could not pay for their treatment and he allowed them to work it off. He had one man who worked off, I think almost a year there, the bill for some type of surgery he did. The man shoveled coal, he empty trash, mowed lawns, cut bushes, all kinds of things to work off his bill. Um, his granddaughter, when I talked to her, said that when she was a kid, she remembered people would bring them bushel baskets of, of things they grew in their garden, of vegetables or fruits or whatever. And people were always bringing them things because they knew they owed him more than what they could ever pay him. And she said that when she was probably about 12 years old or so, one night, the phone rang, and her grandmother answered it and put her grandfather on the phone. He got off the phone, and her father and her grandfather ran out the door. Her grandfather packed his bag, and out the door he went, and she said her dad had a lantern, a gas lantern. I know what I'm talking about. They went to somebody's house, put the person up on the kitchen table, did the surgery on him while dad's holding this gas lantern. So he could see the person actually survived. If you can just imagine that. This was in the 1940s 
And if you lived outside of Indianapolis, there's no guarantee what you were going to get or what would happen. Somebody called and needed help that badly. That man packed his bag, jumped in his car, and away they went, took the son-in-law to hold a light for him where he could do the surgery. Um, that's a dedicated senator. Okay, go ahead. I always try to finish with this slide, and I think it says a lot. This was taken over in Maryland um, off of US 40, and that sign actually reads, General Washington's headquarters. There's a little log cabin building over there. Whether Washington slept there or not, I don't know. But it's a roadside attraction, and they they actually stopped. I've seen this. They actually stopped and posed. But here is a elderly couple still holding hands, clenched up. That man could not have done half of what he did without her. There's just no way in H-E-double-L he could have been as successful as he was without her. She was a school teacher in Indianapolis. She taught the fifth grade. She gives up her career and packs up and goes to Tuskegee, Alabama to support him running that hospital for 12 years. The schools were so poor that their daughter, they enrolled her at Spelman. There was a, a uh, Spelman College ran a girls' school for junior high and high school girls, and they enrolled her there, and the daughter hated it. But the mother and father said, there is no school in Tuskegee that you can go to. We have to do something. So even the daughter pays somewhat of a price. She is enrolled in a boarding school for a number of years while her dad is actually down here running this hospital. So... This is after um, he comes back into Indianapolis before he finally retires for good. And they're doing a road trip, traveling cross country before the interstates are built. And they're still holding hands. They were married in November, 1904. She tragically dies in December, 1954. It's the month after their 50th wedding anniversary. She's been out visiting friends and is on her way home. She gets all the way back to the house and parks the car and has a medical emergency of some sort and can't get out of the car. And it was one of the cars that had electric windows, you know, new modern 1950s car, had electric windows in it. She hit the button and all the windows went down and he did not find her until the next morning around eight o'clock when she was still in the car. They took her to the city hospital and she didn't survive. But for 50 years, she was by his side. Now, if my wife doesn't kick me to the curb <laughs> before I get that old, I've done something. <laughs> Eunice is shaking her head. Eunice knows my wife. Eunice knows me. Anybody puts up with me has got to be out of their mind. This woman went through all these things with him. I said that Indianapolis policeman they brought there and there's so many other stories of the African-American community that we don't really think about. One thing I didn't say about that policeman, he was shot on the north side, put in someone's car, driven to city hospital to Eskenazi. The doctors there, the white doctors, said that his condition was mortal. He was not going to survive. He was shot in the abdomen. Somehow, someone gets word to Dr. Ward. He goes over to city hospital, and he disagrees. He says... I have seen worse. He's still awake. He's talking. We can save him if we try to intervene now. Well, you can't do it here. Okay. They load him up at City Hospital, drive him to 21st and Boulevard Place, get him in there. Dr. Ward and Dr. Leonard Lewis operated on him in the middle of the night. And by sunrise, they're waiting to see if he's actually going to survive the surgery. He survived the surgery. And for a couple of months, it looks like he might make it. But then scar tissue starts to build up in his intestine and eventually chokes off his intestine. He can't digest food. And he starves to death. This is a time before antibiotics, before microsurgery. They couldn't save him. But he survived six months. 
had they listened to the doctors at the city hospital that said that this African-American policeman was mortal and there's nothing we can do about it, he'd have died there in that hospital at night. They'd let him just, just die. And this is who we're talking about. Go ahead. Here's a couple books that you're interested in that I found interesting that helped me with this research. Um, Norma Erickson's um, master's thesis is online. You can read it. And it's all about Lincoln Hospital. Um, there's William Walsh's report. That thing is at the downtown city library. It's also at the IUPUI library. It's if you're bored, it's fascinating reading, but you learn a lot about the city of Indianapolis. Um, the second from the last book, Douglas Fisher and Joanna Buckley wrote the book African American Doctors of World War One. Um, there are individual stories about most of those doctors. They researched most of them and found information on it and put it into a small book. It's to me was very fascinating. Okay, go ahead. Now, if you want to see what 19th century hospitals and medical treatment look like, there is this two-season series on the NIC, which I found fascinating. I found it very, very accurate. And when I was reading up about it, the people who actually made this series did a lot of research to make sure it was historically correct. They actually used a, I think it's a Catholic school in, Catholic high school in New York to film this in. And all of the scenes in the hospital rooms are set, but the outside scenes of this big brick hospital that they're talking about, and it's called the Nick, short for Knickerbocker, is this Catholic high school in New York City. Um, but you'll hear them talk about all kinds of things. Bear in mind that 1900, when Dr. Ward is becoming a doctor and World War I is coming along, germ theory is still fairly new. We don't know about that. We don't know to wash our hands and to put on rubber gloves when we're treating somebody. Um, eugenics was a thing, sexism, class. You'll see all of it in this. It's a fascinating, it, it'll take you all weekend, but if you got nothing else to do, I recommend it. Okay. And now we've got to the end of me rattling on. What questions does anybody have? Um, surely I couldn't have done that good of a job that, yes, ma'am. So people on Zoom can hear. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. We're what's the difference between the sanitarium and the hospital? I don't know the exact difference. You see it used, especially in Europe. They call them sanitariums a lot. I don't think there's a lot of big difference, but there's also two different spellings. Uh there's S A S A N T I R I U M and S A N T I R O M, I think it is. Sanitarium and sanatorium. Uh I think it's just depends on what part of the world you're in. But it's basically a, a small hospital, is what I can tell you this. I don't know why he chose the name Sanitarium. Uh, and he did that before he went to France. So where he got that from, I don't know. One of the things I found fascinating about this guy is when I'm reading about him in 1922, he had an x-ray machine in his facility. It's in the state records when I found that. It's like, wait a minute. X-ray was still new at the time, and he has an X-ray machine in his facility. There were hospitals that didn't have X-ray machines, but he had them. We've got a question from Zoom. Okay. They wanted to know if you knew the name of John Ward's wife. Joseph Ward. Joseph uh, Ward. Zella, G-E-L-L-A, -L -L Zella Ward. Actually, Zella Locklear Ward. She was born here in Indianapolis. Um, they met and married in 1904. He was several years older than her, but they stayed married 50 years, had two kids. One died in the flu pandemic. The other grew to have children and grandchildren. And has a daughter, has a granddaughter named Zella that I've met. Yes, sir. Wait. <laughs> I trust Dr. Albert in some research that I've been doing recently, and I wondered if you had any more information about his life or his career. No, I didn't really research him a lot. Um, Albert is here very early. Um, he is, uh, he treats many of the African-Americans who are false victims of mass illness. 
and some of the research on Green Line Cemetery that Eunice and a few others are doing, you see his name come up a lot on the uh, death records. But um, no, I'm not even sure where he got his medical training. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can, I got here a little late, so maybe you already talked about this, but can you talk about ambulance services for hospitals? Because I know when years ago I was working to save Willis Mortuary uh, over on West Street, and they said that, that the service that um, Mortuary provided for their vehicle is was what was sent out for ambulance care in the community. I don't know if that's accurate or not, so I didn't know if you'd run across that. That happened in Indianapolis and other places that the hearse doubled as an ambulance. Um, racism still played a part in all of this. And the reverse side of what you you asked, I'll start with that. I ran across a case in the 1940s, 1950s, where they were just starting to put uh, black interns into the hospital. And one of the services they had to work on was the ER emergency room. And they had to also get on an ambulance and go out on ambulance runs. So you actually had a doctor, an intern, who was riding with the uh, people on the ambulance. And these guys were not paramedics. That doesn't come for many years. They're just too strong backs to put the person in the back of the ambulance. The reason I'm saying this is that one of the first Black doctors who was there and went through the ER asked, what do I do? if I get out there and I have a white patient that refuses to let me touch them. And they told him, wait for the next ambulance. Now, that's crazy enough. You go out to an emergency scene and this person, you know, needs treatment. Don't touch me. Okay, don't touch him. Now, they didn't have radios. So someone had to call and tell the hospital and then the hospital would start another ambulance and make sure there's a white doctor riding with them to come out here. So you, if you're on the far side of town, it could be a little bit of a wait before that ambulance gets there. And then you got to ride back. Also, um, in some of these same records I found were some of the doctors there at the hospital, like over there at uh, Long Hospital. Some of those early black doctors went over there and you had patients who refused to let the black doctors and the black nurses touch them and they started having black nurses. No, they did not want that. They had to have a white doctor, a white nurse. So you have the same kind of a problem when you have some of the white attendants on the ambulances going out in either not wanting to pick up a black patient or not treating them very nice or very well. So, or the, you know, um, all the ambulances are busy. You could call up one of the funeral homes and they would send a hearse out and you could ride in the hearse back to the hospital. But once you got back, there's no guarantee that they would actually take care of you, but that's just the way it was. And Indianapolis was not unique in this, this way. It's just that we don't really know and understand it. Come on, I know I didn't do that well. Not possible. Um, yes, sir. I think he's the next generation, but do you know anything about Dr. Harvey Middleton? Middleton comes a few years later. He's a heart specialist, uh, cardiac specialist, we call him today. Um, I don't know a lot about Middleton and what he did, but he is in, there's a whole two or three generations of these guys that go through all these kind of things. And one thing that I should have said about Dr. Ward, I put those dates up for a reason. Dr. Ward becomes a medical doctor in 1896 or 1897. Plessy versus Ferguson is decided in 1896, the year before. He practices medicine up until the 18, 1950s, somewhere, I'm not sure exactly when he stops. He dies in 1955 at the 10th Street VA Hospital. He's actually a patient. Things have changed. But his whole career is bookended by Plessy versus Ferguson and Board versus Brown versus Board of Education. In the height of all that Jim Crow madness, this man becomes a doctor, a surgeon, a hospital owner, a army officer, a uh, 
he becomes a leader of an army field hospital. He becomes the head of a veterans hospital. And when he took over the VA hospital, it eventually became, it was the largest black hospital in the country, but it became one of the largest hospitals in the nation. It was the fourth or fifth largest hospital in the United States. The only ones bigger than it were like Cook County in Chicago, Bellevue in New York. There's one in Los Angeles and maybe one in San Francisco. And then there was Tuskegee VA. It was just that big. I and mean, at one point, they had 1,300 patients. It was a huge operation, and he ran it. Um, he was also, I, I learned, he was quite self-conscious about the fact he did not have a college degree. Um, but he was an outstanding surgeon, outstanding administrator, leader. What can I say? Like I said, I don't know a lot about Middleton, but I do know he was a a uh, cardiac specialist here for a number of years. And it was people like Lo Ward, Lewis, and Furness who set the stage for him to come along and to be able to be successful. To show you how bad it was, my mom went to nursing school at Marion County General Hospital. And when she got accepted in the program, she said that there were, I think, 60 student nurses came in that year with her and only four African-Americans. And she said, but they had to be even numbers. Huh? Even numbers, what are you talking about? Two or four. What do you mean? We had to share rooms. So they brought them in in even numbers, and she was one of the four the year she started over there. Um, so still, we had problems, even in the 1950s. Come on, I almost start crying. Yes, sir. Uh, doctor uh, did his internship in Shelbyville. Henry Hummers, yes, sir. What, where would he have, have interned out there? Was there a, a, a sizable African American community? Or, you know, you think of Shelbyville back it's then. It's a small as, town. As, as, as rural as it can possibly be. It's a small town, and I believe it was the Shelby County Hospital. So probably there in Shelbyville someplace, I'm not sure. He graduated from the IU School of Medicine and then went to do his internship out there. He did it and came back. Um, just a few years before he does that, uh, Lewis graduates from IU School of Medicine. And then there's a dust up as to whether or not he can go to City Hospital. And eventually, Lewis gets to go to City Hospital because several prominent white doctors threatened to walk away if they did not let him do his internship. Um, and that's before World War One. I, I mean, the exact date there. There was another doctor back earlier than that, that a student doctor. He graduated from the Iowa School of Medicine, and then eventually goes to Chicago to do his internship because um, they wouldn't let him in there. They actually offered him the internship and then withdrew it and would not negotiate, wouldn't talk about it. Said, nope, I'm not going to have you. Can't be here. He eventually goes to a hospital in Chicago and does his training there. All right. That was very interesting. Now, Leon, I thank you. And I thank you all for coming. I thank our sponsors for this too. And um, I want to also encourage you to check out our webpage for upcoming programs. In fact, the next one, um, Conversations in Indian and African American History and Culture is on Thursday, March 21st here at Landmarks. Kayla Austin will discuss the history of Norwood. Some of you are probably hearing about Norwood. It's um, a neighborhood that partners with uh, Barrington. It's located on the southeast side of Indianapolis. And she will also talk about the USCT, United States Colored Troop Veterans. And um, it should be an int another interesting program. So... The, it's on March 21st here at Landmarks. You can register online, 
see it online or show up here. And I also want to remind you to consider making a tax deductible contribution to Freetown Village. Consider volunteering in some capacity. We have positions open for our board and committees. And don't forget to complete your evaluation. So the QR code will be popping up pretty soon. There's also one there at the door. QR, quick response. It's a quick response. Complete your QR code. Let us know what you think. And Leon will be here for further questions if you thought of something you didn't think to ask or wanted to ask him because he knows everything. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, ma'am. Upstairs and doing all the chronometers. Oh, shut down. Yeah, on the last one out. Oh, man. I'm going to